thank you for that because I would have totally forgot that. <laughs> All right, sure. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to our breakout session um, about uh, indigenous curriculum and how you can implement it, implementing our perspectives through different uh, content areas. Um, we're hoping to uh, have some good conversations and, and um, share some ideas and maybe bounce some ideas off of each other. So that way we could be more um, culturally accurate, uh, culturally respectful, um, as we, you know, when we do incorporate uh, indigenous uh, stories or, or activities into the classroom. Um, we'd like if you guys could, uh, in the chat, um, maybe just share your name. Um, I know we have a few things listed here, but most importantly, maybe just share your name and, and an activity that you've used or maybe seen used um, for teaching indigenous culture or history and no judgment here. We're not. We're not going to judge anybody for anything. So just whatever you've used or you you thought might be uh, you've seen used, um, share that with us. You can also mute their mics. Living voices. Okay. I can't see the chat. So. Education Center show and tell bring a dish traditional dance. Oh, that's cool. Get, cool. get them to, yeah, very awesome. So Living Voices, um, Education Center show and tell bring a dish traditional dance. Those are, those are very cool things. Um, sounds like uh, like field trip type, type activities, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Trail of Tears and Seminole Wars when teaching wow. about U.S. expansion of Slavery, oh, very good. Um, 14 years ELA, students create an art quote reflecting their culture, that's awesome. Wow. We're gonna talk a little bit about something, something in regards to that later. I love that I'm seeing like all these different ideas because um, I can say in my own school, you know, I see the kids with the paper band headdress and what do we say, the yeah. paper bag paper vests. Bag vest. always happens. And that's generally all I see like in elementary school. I know that like in the middle school and the high school, you know, they're doing so much more, which like makes my heart happy. Pick a tribe and make a book about the tribe. That's cool. That, 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 that uh, encourages their own research and stuff. That's very cool. Grandparents stories. Uh, Living Voices was shared links by Brad Crown Public Schools this year. Yeah. Folk stories. Yeah. And that's a big one. I think, I think the folk stories that, that we have as indigenous people get overlooked at how valuable they are. And that's another thing we're going to talk about today. Um, a unit on Caribbean and indigenous literature, very awesome. Read alouds, We Are Water Protectors, excellent book, yeah. Sadly, I don't have that book yet. I have to get that book. Yeah, I, I, I can't let you borrow it, I have it in my room. Research the truth on cowboys and Indians. Okay. Cool. Sure how, okay, so yeah. All right, and some teachers have done, like, you know, sometimes you do something and you learn like, hey, this isn't the best thing to do and you change, that's awesome. And I love that, that you're able to implement that feedback and say, hey, you know, a student told me this was not necessarily appropriate and, and then you've changed your practices. That's really, really cool. And what we're hoping to do today is um, like open it, like we have some stuff planned, but we really wanna open it to, you know, there's a lot of like your student coming to you and telling you that's not accurate or whatever. There's a lot of people out there telling you what not to do, but there's not always the guidance of telling you what to do. So we're hoping today that we can actually share with you um, some ideas, but also answer any questions that you have. Like, hey, you got three natives right here. Um, just shoot, you know, shoot the questions and hopefully we can answer. Um, teaching math and there are some actually content connections that you can make for math as well, which we'll, we'll talk about a few. That's a little bit tricky, but we, we have a few ideas for that. Um, Aloha oi. Ooh. That's really cool. Hawaiian, Hawaiian music can be difficult. It's, it's often very sexual, even though they're talking about plants and flowers. <laughs> you know, like a lot of the songs and my, my ex-husband is Hawaiian. So my daughter's um, Native American and Native Hawaiian. Um, 
And I, I actually met with Kelly E. Rochelle and we were talking about some songs and he's like, you know, that song's about sex. That song's about sex. That song's about sex. And I'm like, forget it. No, no more Hawaiian songs for my kid. No. <laughs> but no, that's really cool that you that you did that. I saw a, a comment about using poetry and uh, to teach the, the culture. Uh, very cool. I actually have a book of some poems here that I'm going to be sharing with you guys in a little while. Um, history of Americans before European colonization. Yeah, the, what, what was here before the Europeans were here? That's that's definitely powerful and sometimes gets skipped over. So thank you for that. Um, looking for ideas on ways to incorporate indigenous culture and history. Excellent. All, All right. right. I think I think we're going to go ahead and, and, and get started. So these are some great uh, ideas. And if you have ideas or questions along the way, feel free to pop them into the chat. We'll do our best to answer and, and, and discuss as we go. We would like to keep this kind of relaxed and as open and and uh, collaborative as possible. So your norms, your typical stay engaged, speak your truth, mute your microphone, unless you're telling us something, please definitely share. We're open to hearing from everybody and assume positive intent. So sometimes things get sticky, you know, when people are not sure how to say something, say it. Um, and we're gonna all assume that we're coming from a positive place. All right. Um, I'm Colton Griffith. Uh, I'm a teacher here in Broward County Public Schools. I teach fourth grade. I've been teaching for six years and I'm also our equity liaison. Uh, I'm Saginaw Chippewa and Cherokee. And um, I'm really excited to be here and sharing some ideas with you guys today. I can, I don't have to read. Um, my name is Ninoska Slater. I'm the second presenter. Um, I've been teaching for three years at Broward County Public Schools. I am also a fourth grade teacher at Coral Springs Pre-K to Eight, and I come from. I am. I'm at a Bolivian. And I am Kim Cunningham, also a fourth grade teacher. Seems to be the thing to, to do right now, fourth grade. <laughs> um, I've been teaching for 26 years. Scary, huh? I'm only 27, so that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> four years with Broward County Public Schools. Um, I'm at Wellamy, also the Equity Liaison, and I'm Kenyagaha Mohawk and Oglala Lakota, as well as Spanish, French, African, everything. A little bit very good. I'm a mutt. We're all mutts. Most of us are, yeah. We're all mutts. So we wanted to start out with you um, with, th like Thanksgiving seems to be the time that we become um, relevant in um, education. So we thought we would start with, we first we tried to stay away from Thanksgiving at all, but then we thought we'll start with Thanksgiving and try to give you some ideas of how to have the Thanksgiving celebrations and the ceremonies and all the different things we do in school and maybe a more cultural appropriate light. Yeah. Yes. So I wanted to read to you um, a, this is actually a, a, a prayer um, written out, um, a prayer that kids learn in school and you know say every day, um, but literature as well. And now we will speak again, our creator, Oh, the thanks to the trees. Sorry, the thanks to the trees. Thanks, teach. Remember the title. And now we will begin. We will speak again. Our creator decided trees will be on earth, growing here and there. Also, forests will be growing of trees. Grooves will be growing on earth. And it is still true that trees grow here and there. Our creator decided this will be something important. For from these trees, medicines can come. And certain it is that they are still growing. All of them are different in the way they grow. Our creator decided all of the trees will have names. Every one of them, that people will know them. The people who will live here on earth, and it is possible that from these trees within their families, people will grow well. It is possible that people will draw on these trees when it changes. The wind, when it grows colder, the wind, it is possible that when, I knew it was gonna have a hard time reading. It is possible that then people will be kept warm and they will work together as one, kept warm by that which he left, the live coals on earth. Our creator decided the trees will work together well on bringing happiness to families on earth. And we will think, and we still think it is coming to pass in this manner. And carefully now the creator decided the trees will have this one to lead them. People living on earth will say, that tree standing there, the maple, it is a special tree. Our creator decided when it becomes warm, the wind, it is then 
that the sap will flow. So it is that the maple tree will be tapped. From there, it will be collected that it may be boiled down by the people. And so then it will be possible for the people to drink the maple syrup again. And it is possible then that people will be gathered. It is important also that the people gather together then. Medicine we made from the maple syrup and the people moving about, people on earth will be helped. And when it becomes warm, the wind, it is true that we saw again, this new sap was raising. And it came to pass that we drank the maple syrup again. And it was possible that we were gathered together at what we call maple sugar gathering, the maple festival. And so it is, we thank our, thank our creator in the way that we felt it if we, in the way we felt if we should always thank him at ceremonies. And we think the ceremony has come to pass. Let us put together our thoughts that we will always be grateful. For it is certain that he is sending them to us. The trees which are standing on earth, we are the ones our creator thought of. Those trees were meant to be used well by those of us moving about on earth. Carefully now, it is that we thank him. The one who dwells in the skies. So quite Tom. The poem, the prayer, actually not really a poem, um, is it's, this is piece of a larger, much longer poem and um, prayer that during gatherings and times for thanks, and we don't celebrate Thanksgiving like one day a year, but um, in giving thanks, you start with the trees and the water and those that dwell on the earth and those that dwell in the sky. So this is just a piece of that, of that prayer. It is also important to 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 um, realize that um, we in our culture we don't give thanks only once a year. It is a practice that is done year round. So um, and I am specifically from um, the southern hemisphere versus um, here Colton and uh, Kim, and it seems like our cultures uh, the practices in our cultures are very similar when it comes to that. Yeah. So when you're when you are bringing up Native Americans around Thanksgiving, if that's something that you do, I see Silver and Chesses, they no longer uh, do that in their classroom, but they, they do like a Friendsgiving thing. And that's cool. We actually, when we when it's come time for us to celebrate Thanksgiving, um, I told my wife I didn't want to raise my kid doing that. And she was like, well, I really like cooking, so let's make it a Friendsgiving. So that's what we did. But um, it, it's, it's a good opportunity to expose your children to the fact that, you know, many cultures around the world really do give thanks all the time. And it's not like a, you don't need a special occasion. So you can take the narrative out of this story about pilgrims and, and, and Indians, which, yeah, maybe that's something that happened probably, but uh, if we're going to call it Thanksgiving, let, let's, let's, let's let it be what, it, what Thanksgiving really is. And that's just a time to give thanks to everything that that you require to sustain you and that should be an everyday thing um but it's a great opportunity to expose your students to those perspectives maybe through um literature like like the like the um prayer that that uh kim and uh Ninoska just shared for us and some other activities too that you could do pose if you really like if you've got little ones and you really want to do like some hands-on stuff uh you know you don't have to make like paper headbands and you don't have to make you know, that's like somebody says they, they talked about what kind of food they ate. Um, it's a good time to look around and find out what foods grow natively in your in the town that we live in. What, what foods grow here in the Everglades that would have been part of a, a harvest or, or a Thanksgiving type meal. And which is a good project for the older. Yes, and that's a good project for older students, too. But it, so that, that's knowing your your local ecosystem diversity that ties in science, uh, it ties in social studies. Um, and it can tie in literature as well. 
but also think about how much your kids don't know about the land that they live on. How much do you know about the land that you live on and what grows here natively? Um, it's a good opportunity to really explore those things and, and be in deeper touch with, you know, the area of this earth that sustains you and your family and your students. And in terms of the, um, the feathers, because um, I know a lot of the younger classes like to do that, there is a way to do it in a more cultural, culturally appropriate way. So for example, one of, in our PD, we, you know, we talk about feathers and we talk about the cultural significance and the importance of feathers for us. And um, you know, I can speak for myself as a Lakota, um, as a Mohawk, we, you know, we use feathers, but in a different way than, than as a Lakota. But most people, when they're doing the feathers, they're, they're using the plains, you know, the typical, the plains, the Lakota, the Chippewa, um, Ojibwe, they're using, you know, how we used our feathers, but not, not in a correct way. So for example, we earn our feathers. OK, um, we do good deeds. We do, you know, things right. Um, you know, it used to be in battle and in, in acts of bravery. We would earn a feather. So you'll see like feathers here on the wall behind me. I've earned every one of those feathers. The feathers I wear in my hair, I've earned those feathers. I have more feathers in my house. I've earned those feathers, you know, by things that I've done. Um, so if you wanted to do, you know, in the class around Thanksgiving and you wanted to do that, then maybe as kids did things in the classroom above and beyond the normal, you know, maybe they, they helped a, a classmate outside that, you know, normally doesn't play with anybody and they spend time with that student or, you know, they helped clean the cafeteria or, you know, something that's out of the ordinary, they could earn a feather. And then when you put that headdress on them and they have those feathers in, they, you are tying it to something that's culturally appropriate. You're still getting, you know, those feathers and that cute little thing that we do in the kindergarten and the first grade, that stuff, but it has the meaning behind it. And so they're learning the cultural importance and the significance. They're also learning to be good and to be kind and they're getting the art. So you, you've got all of that encompassed together. Yeah, and uh, just when you do it, just make sure that you're also culturally specific because not all, not all of us, there's over 500 tribes here in North America alone that's not including Central South America. And most of them don't do that. So, right. you know, it is a cool thing to do. And like Kim's, uh, what Kim is recommending would be a very fun way to incorporate a, that kind of old inappropriate activity into something new and appropriate. Mm -hmm. Culturally specific, like you, you know which students are the ones that, that do this, like the Lakota. Um, what about making dream catchers? How is that viewed? I can actually answer this because I'm Ojibwe and dream catchers come from my nation. So, um, I would say there's nothing wrong with making dream catchers. Go for it, definitely. Like use the proper materials, um, you know, try to stay, you could use metal hoops if you want, but um, you can get like little willow branches and stuff like that, that you can bend and it'd be a really cool experience for the kids. Um, and make sure you teach the stories that go. It's very easy to find the story actually of, of the dream catcher and how it came to our people. Um, so there's yeah. One there. Yeah, there is one up here. It's um, on my acoustic. But um, and my head's blocking out my camera. But uh, just make sure you, you include the story with it so they know what the context of this is. Because, you know, you, you see dream catchers hanging from rear view mirrors of cars. And, you know, natives do it too. I get on my friends all the time who do it. But <laughs> it, it, dream catchers really were used for um, infants. Uh, and they would go over the cradle board or, or um, where, the, where the infant slept in the corner of the window um, where it could be used properly. And then eventually, traditionally, what would happen because the materials it was made out of, it would break. And that was the signal that the, the child no longer needs it. Um, so yeah, you can make dream catchers. Just make sure you, you, you include the history of it. Don't just make a dream catcher as a fun Indian activity to do with your students. So, so a lot of these things really are not inappropriate. Like some things are not inappropriate to do. If you teach the why. If you teach the why and you, and you don't take our history out of it. I think that's usually what ends up happening is we're removed from the practice and it just becomes a thing that that somehow gets identified that identifies all native people. Like when you think of natives, you probably think of headdresses, dream catchers, uh, the things that you're familiar with, but they only define such a small, like small select cultures within hundreds. So yeah, do it, but yeah, just make sure you you go into it with history and it's not hard to find. The history and dream catcher is very, very, uh, you, there's, you can Google it. I'm sure you'd find a bajillion accurate. It, and that's important too, is knowing if it's accurate or not, but accurate stories about the history and where it comes from and you know how the spider gave it to our people. And, 
uh, it's pretty cool. So I definitely, I definitely would encourage you to do that. And so going from that, we went into another story that you could use in school, which was the 13 moons on Turtle's Back. Yeah, and this is actually pretty cool. Um, I can hold it up here on my camera. Uh, this is by Joseph Bircek. Uh, he is a well-known indigenous author. You actually probably have books in your library from him if you're not aware. Um, but uh, he, has he does a lot of traditional indigenous stories from all over North America and some Central and South America too. And he also has um, original works, fictional works that he does. Um, but this one's really, really cool because it's simple and you can tie it into content across the board, uh, science, social studies, math, obviously ELA, uh, writing even if you would. And uh, it's, it could be something that, that goes into year long projects or temporary projects. So it's a really, really cool resource to use that can exp you know, get your kids thinking about the perspectives that indigenous people have and how, you know, these, you know, complicated uh, concepts of nature and of math are, are included in our stories, even if you only perceive them as being folk tales or myth, it's, it's all there. Um, so hopefully, so I'm gonna share a couple short of these short poems with you, they're not long. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how some of the connections here that you can make. So again, 13 Moons on a Turtle's Back. And in this book is a, is a poem. Each one is from a different tribal nation. Um, not all tribes, especially depending on where they were geographically located, uh, did a lunar calendar, but it was very, very common. Um, and if you want to, so Kim here is holding up uh, a turtle shell. And I don't know if you guys can see it that well, because I know we're sharing our screen, but, um, and on the turtle shell itself, if you look the scales around the rim of the shell, you have one scale for each day of the month. And then the large scales in the middle, you have 13 for each moon for the, for the lunar year. So the, the, the turtle shell, and here's a, like a, a printout that you can find. These are actually like, you can find these on Pinterest. Or the I put Pinterest. All, they're all in the resource list that I put on. And we have a resource list on there that you guys can access this from. Um, but it's really, really cool how you can find the connection to the calendar right there in nature from a very sacred animal. The turtle comes up in many of our creation stories. But uh, I, I'm kind of like getting all over the place here. So let me come back to it. So um, using this concept here, and again, this, this ties science directly to our, our knowledge of, of just observing nature. But um, there's a few, a few poems in here I'm going to share with you. I'm going to talk about how you could connect them to different concepts. So the 13 moons before he goes, the 13 moons are the, the, the scoots, as he was saying, and each month, the lunar, you know, the lunar calendar, like a lot of people don't know. Yeah. So like, because we go, we go by, you know, uh, was it the solar calendar? Is that how it's? It, no. Yeah. Yeah. So like, um, but a lot of indigenous cultures, again, depending geographically where you're located, because that, that might affect how, how you, how the moons are uh, come about, but um a lot of them went off of a, off of a lunar calendar. So um, the first poem I'm gonna share with you is called Frog Moon, all right? This comes from the Cree. And I really like this one because it, 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 it ties in math. So gosh, it makes me excited. <laughs> um, when the world was young, the trickster met with all of the animals to decide how many moons would be winter. Moose answered, there should be as many moons of winter as hairs on my body. Amik the beaver said, there should be as many moons, as many winter moons as scales on my tail. Then the little frog said, there should only be as many moons of snow as toes on my foot. And so Trickster decided that um, frog was right. So it is that winter lasts only five moons. And when it ends, the small frogs sing their victory song uh, in this moon with their name. It was a short poem, so it's not long, right? But I wonder if you guys can think of what kind of uh, concepts you might tie into a, a poem like this now, or a story like this. Did anything come to mind as I was reading? They said, oh, that, I can see a content connection there or, or uh, an activity connection there. And I'm gonna move on to the next one, but if you had a connection, you can go ahead and put it into the chat and I'll come back to it. All right, the next poem I wanna share with you is The Budding Moon. And again, I want you to think about the concepts that you might be able to tie in to what's being said in, the, in these poems or these short stories. 
One year, old man winter refused to leave our land. So our people asked for help from, the, from our great friend, son. Um, he knocked on the door of winter's lodge and then entered and sat by winter's cold fire. Leave here or you will freeze, said winter. But son just breathed and winter grew smaller. Sun waved his hand and a white owl flew down to carry winter to the deep snow of the north. The lodge melted away and the trees turned green with new buds as the birds began to sing. And where the cold fire of winter had been was a circle of white mayflowers. So it happens each spring when the budding moon comes, all the animals wake and we follow them across our wide, beautiful land. All right, and this is a story from the Huron called The Budding Moon. And then lastly, I've got a Cherokee one for you for my own people, Moon of the Falling Leaves. Long ago, the trees were told that they must stay awake seven days and nights, but only the cedar, the pine, and the spruce stayed awake until the seventh night. The reward they were given was to always be green while all the other trees must shed their leaves. So each autumn, the leaves of the sleeping trees fall. They cover the floor of our woodlands with colors as bright as the flowers that come with the spring. The leaves return the strength of one more year's growth to the earth. This journey the leaves are taking is part of that great circle, which holds us all close to the earth. And that's called the moon of the falling leaves from the Cherokee. Now, uh, again, if you had any ideas of how you might connect it, to different content, uh, please please go ahead and put them in the chat. But I'm gonna go through some, some thoughts that I have as a teacher when I read these. Um, first off, you can clearly see the connection between the changing of seasons, all right? We're talking about a lunar calendar. So you have calendar math that you can put in here. Um, you have uh, moon cycles, obviously, probably one of the most, most um, obvious. obvious ones, yeah. Um, but one thing that really strikes me to it is, is how they describe the changing, how one moon leads to the next and, and, and mark, uh, or the marking of a new season through animal behavior or through plant behavior. Um, and these are all scientific concepts that you can tie in when you're teaching about food pyramids or, or food chains, or you're teaching about ecosystems or plant life cycles. Um, this is an awesome way to introduce an indigenous perspective and tie in an ELA uh, content to those subject areas in a way that gets students engaged. All right. Um, also, I talked about math, the uh, frog moon, and they were talking about um, you know the, the winter, uh, the snow, the winter moon should be as many hairs on my body or as many scales on my tail. Um, you can tie that into counting. Um, I, I've read where some teachers. Uh, bring like a piece of, um, maybe everybody wouldn't have access to this, but you could always go to like the, um, like Joanne's and get a, a strip of, you know, fake fur or something like that and give, you know, give it to your students say, can you count how many hairs, you know, are on this strip of fur, which would be an incredible task, right? So to, to think about that perspective as they're, as they're talking about how many moons should be the winter moons. And um, then to talk about how many, you know, fingers or toes does a frog have and, you know, having like a debate even about what, what would make more sense. Um, it's a cool way to incorporate, and that's, that's counting. So that would be really good for like primary grades. Like, was they're learning, um, is they're learning their numbers and they're counting. Um, also another cool idea that, that you could do with a book like this, as you're talking about the moons and each story comes from a different nation. There are little clues about the landscape in each of these poems or the type, maybe the wildlife that's there or um, the type of trees that are there. Uh, a cool thing to do for upper grades would be to um, have them research the nations uh, in North America and try to map, uh, try to create a map of, of where the tribe, where this tribe is located or, um, yeah, that would probably be the best way to, where, where the tribe is located on the map and then they can compare and then you can, you know, eventually show the whole map and see if they were right or wrong. It'd be a really engaging way to, to do uh, regions or geography, or, or I know that um, upper grades teach units about the different nations across North America. Um, is a cool way to incorporate, again, the ELA component, make it a little bit more fun, more investigative, which is 
you know, how indigenous people learn through investigating and experiencing and exploring. Um, really fun way to do that, I thought. Petra also mentioned symbolism and descriptive language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's so an idea. when it comes to, to the ELA connection, like you can, uh, yeah, you can, you can connect it to any, um, and we're going to talk about it. Kim's going to actually talk about that for you guys. So, in, I mean, the ELA part was was actually easy because, you know, it's I, you're you're using a book. So you're starting with literature. So you have that um, you can talk about theme of the different of each of the different moons. Like, what is the theme? Like, why is that moon called that moon? You know, what's going on in the poem? Um, visual information, text features, you know, all of that with this book and many others, historical and scientific text. Um, because a lot of the things, you know, written on Native American, they are historical and scientific texts and our kids need to, you know, be uh, exposed to more of that reading. Okay, chronology in this. So you're talking about, you know, talking with the kids, the chronology, um, not just in time, but in talking about like the, the, the months and then the seasons. So the chronology of the seasons and the time and how it works on the, can you even see that one holding that up? Yes, we can. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, comparing contrast, we were talking about um, comparing and contrasting ideas like the food you eat now for Thanksgiving, as opposed to the food that would have been eaten, you know, at that time, the food you eat here, the, like Colton was saying, the food that's indigenous to the area, native to the area, um, you know, what are the foods? Because, you know, we get food from everywhere because they ship it in from Publix. But, you know, what if we had to do Thanksgiving based on what is here in South Florida, what would be eat, would we be eating for Thanksgiving? What would you be eating if you lived in Alaska? What would you be eating if you lived in Oklahoma? So, you know, that's, you know, more the older kids than the younger kids, you know, that sort of research and stuff. Um, comparing and contrasting the calendars, the calendar, you know, that we use the lunar calendar as opposed to the calendar now and how that changed. And you, there you get into Roman history and, you know, all that stuff with, um, Octavius and, you know, Caesar and all of that. And, you know, the months changing to honor different people. Um, lengths of days and months. And, um, you know, even like getting into, you know, uh, life skills that we do at the end of the year when you're talking about a woman's flow and it that's based on the moon. So, you know, it's all, it's all tied in. Um, and then again, the poetry and comparing maybe because this isn't like the traditional rhymey poetry that kids are used to seeing when you first do poetry with them. So it's a different type of poetry, maybe even comparing that to the spoken slam poetry that, you know, is out and is very, you know, popular with, with the teen scene, basically comparing, you know, those, the spoken poetries. Um, so that compare and contrast, but also getting into point of view. Uh, what's the point of view of, the story from the Native American perspective, as opposed to Thanksgiving from the, you know, European perspective, which is what we know Thanksgiving to be. Um, and then, you know, again, the normal elements of story and poetry, I think that one is a given. But this was actually, um, you guys had the, the book yeah, that this came from. Yes, right here. You want to talk about that for a second? We're, we're, we're working on possibly life. getting it to, um, in our schools because it is a valuable resource that can that guides you in connecting um, indigenous stories to science, which is a, a rare and, and useful resource. And the beautiful thing about this book is that it gives you ideas on how to um, implement, how to use the stories along with activities that you can, you know, that, that will help you in different content areas. So it's a really cool book. There's actually several in the series. Uh, that's just the one that, that we happen to have. But um, again, we're, ho we're hoping to be able to get it to you guys. If it's something you might want to jump the gun on and, and look into yourself, they're available on Amazon. They're not expensive. They're within like 20 to like $25, I think. Um, but they, it's actually written, again, it's uh, Joseph Juracek, the same person who, who did the, the 13 Moons. Um, and it really, it really helps you understand the value of indigenous stories and knowledge as it pertains to science and, and uh, the understanding of our natural world, which gets realistically gets lost in the way that we teach. Like again, as we mentioned before, how many of you know what foods are actually available natively here? Like what could you, if you were lost in the wild, what do you know that you can survive on out there in the Everglades aside from, you know, like animal? Um, we don't have that connection anymore. We're sort of losing it. I would maybe not all of us, but I'd say as a society in general, um, 
So it's really, it's really cool. And I would say important to incorporate these perspectives because without us making a conscious effort to do it, as you can see, these the past several hundred years where, where there has not been a conscious effort to include indigenous perspectives, um, the earth is what suffers and then we in turn suffer from that. Okay, so then um, we also wanna talk a little bit about the arts and math. Um, I know math is one of those content areas that is it's very difficult to, 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 to connect with um, literature, social studies, um, you know, science is a little more easier, but um, in this particular case, you know, based on the on the text that we that we have um, and the the what we're talking about here, which is uh, giving thanks, um, as uh, as Colton and, and and Kim have explained, is something that we do um, all year round, and also uh, we 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 give thanks to nature. So there are so many things, so many different ways that we can use um, math in order to incorporate, we can incorporate math when, while we're teaching these type of um, concepts. Um, uh, we had normally used nature uh, or we thanks for nature because it's what sustains us. Um, and uh, we can incorporate uh, math by uh, using measurement. Um, if uh, students, uh, feel free to bring your students out into uh, nature and just have them, they can measure plants and, uh -huh. you know, um, you know, there's different ways. Uh, they can measure lengths, um, add, subtract, um, and then um, even teach them about um, measurement, measuring using uh, standard, different types of standard units. Um, also, you can also incorporate a uh, conversion for the upper grader, uh, upper, uh, upper grade levels. Uh, conversion of measurement. Um, also, um, it, the, this particular, we, I actually, we were actually um, talking about, um, since we live here in South Florida, and we live close to a, um, the Seminoles, you know, that's, that's our, our local tribe. Our local tribe. Um, we were very um, interested by the patchwork, that one of the things that they do is patchwork. So we were um, looking into it and um, it's a beautiful activity. We actually all did our uh, activity with our students. Uh, and these are the different types of patchwork that we had, that we, we came up with. It's they're essentially their um, bookmarks. And um, we can incorporate this in math uh, by using, for example, uh, line of uh, symmetry, symmetry, teaching symmetry. Um, you know, just kind of, um, they're essentially mirror image and, um, measurement was important. Teach, measurement was important. <laughs> yeah. So we were laughing with Kim, uh, yesterday while, while we were working on this because I, I told her, I said, I'm not, I'm not measuring. And she said, well, you, you kind of have to measure in order for it to be accurate. So <laughs> it was funny. We were laughing, uh, because it's essentially what we're trying to do is teach math. So measurement obviously needs to be a part of it. Um, and uh, we came up with this really, really nice um, bookmarks. And you can teach symmetry, you can teach uh, measurement, you can even teach um, angles, you know, measuring angles, um, uh, uh, two, uh, two dimensional shapes, uh, we could compose and recognize for the lower uh, grade levels, compose and, rec and recognize two dimensional shapes. Um, even getting to area and perimeter, um, you know, just classifying the shapes by their properties uh, uh, of, you know, lines and angles. So there's so many things you can do with this specific, and, 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 and we have to use the resources that we have around here. You know, we live near a, 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 a tribe, uh, which are the Seminoles. So, you know, it's nice to, to, to make this actually relevant for, the, for, for our students. So making this type of connections makes the learning definitely more meaningful for them. So also, if you notice on the slide here, since we're talking about patchwork, um, and we, we have the simple bookmark and we actually have the, the step-by-steps for how you guys can use it. We have the instructions. But um, before that, you, you'll notice in the top right of the screen here, we have um, 
different symbols for different things because the, the patterns do mean something. Um, so there, and you can see the different geometry uh, connections in it. And so again, you can use that as, as a math connection. You can use it as a way for students to tell stories through art, um, to tying in art and literature as well um, to mathematics. The one at the bottom is the actual turtle, the patchwork for the turtle. But um, I thought that one was a little bit more complicated for students to actually do on paper or fabric. So we did a more simple one. Um, but that's where we got the patchwork tied in with the turtle and also, you know, local culture. Yeah. So, and, and like you say, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right. Like the, the connection to nature uh, is something indigenous people, like, I know we get a rep for being like super like connected to nature. I think that's true for any indigenous culture because you can't thrive without understanding the land that you live on. And in Ameri in Western society, it's not even American society, but in Western society, we are so far divorced from that, um, that concept because we're people from all over the world um, for the most part who have come to live on a land that doesn't necessarily, their, their ancestors don't know this land. So, I mean, you have, um, like, I, like I know through the connection of slavery and the agricultural knowledge that enslaved people brought here with them, they're able to, to learn the land, but it wasn't, you know, that was them learning the land. It wasn't the, the you know, like European Americans here. And unfortunately that's the perspective that we teach from is that European perspective and not that there's anything wrong with the European perspective, but um, it, it could be so much greater with the incorporation of the knowledge of the land that, that other indigenous cultures can bring to the table. So I, I agree with you. Um, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, Tesla. <laughs> Yeah, we were talking about that yesterday, actually. <laughs> cool. All right, so we're going to show you this next slide. This is um, the instructions for the bookmark if you want to screenshot it. Um, but it's also in your resources. Also in the resources. Um, but yeah, it's really, really simple. And uh, I did it with my students in the, the last week of school. They had a, like, it was really cool to see them work with, um, you know, cutting the strips and, and trying to get the angles right to make the pattern work. And uh, it was a really, really fun way to make math hands-on without using the same tired manipulatives that we that we use. And um, yeah, and we went a little further. Like they got like a little adventurous with changing up the patterns. So going from just the normal patterns, and they were like, "Oh, what if we change this?" So that experimentation, and you know, they're not afraid to experiment. So that was cool. So the, the change in that, and then cutting them different sizes and creating different patterns. So they, you know. The concept they they got it and enjoyed and it like fun. you said hands-on math it's fun it's fun and then you get to teach a little bit of cultural you know local um, culture so, and i like to end read a book long enough that you need a bookmark yes <laughs> so we got about five minutes left i think in our time is that is that accurate um so uh I'd like to use this time that if anybody has questions, it doesn't even have to be about what we talked about, but if you have questions or comments or something you were wondering about, uh, or maybe something you want to see clarification about, um, we're, we're open to answering or talking about anything you might have on your mind in regards to indigenous people or how you Native might use in the resources. Hot seat. Yeah. I did have one question. I know as I, um, I've been teaching for I would say about the same time as Kim, about 27 years, somewhere around there. And- um, We're youngins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that kind of stuck out to me is the lack of native indigenous students in these school districts. I'm, I'm talking about Dade, Broward, Palm Beach. And historically, um, I want to say they haven't really, um, I would say taken to this Western um, centered uh, educational process. There's, there's, there, there's a reason for that because, you know, like when Colton and I, we both came up in Broward County Public Schools. Um, when I came up in Broward County Public Schools, there were a lot of seminal kids in, in the public schools. Um, but, you know, what occurred for me, um, I know for Colton and I know for a lot of, you know, my seminal friends here, was again hearing history from the European perspective and you know your culture being completely edged out and always being painted the bad guy 
I know for myself, when, when school started for my daughter, I home educated my daughter for her entire career because, you know, as an indigenous Hawaiian and an indigenous, you know, American, the last thing I wanted her to hear was how bad her people were at any point in her education, because that was tough for me. And I went through a lot of soul searching. And so I know the tribe as a whole collectively, you know, decided that their kids were better served outside of the public school system. And that's something, we, you know, the, the three of us are like, you know, butting heads everywhere we go and working so hard to change that because, you know, they should be here. They should be a part of the narrative, but we can't bring them back in until we change the narrative that they're that they're exposed to. Right. You're saying that vilification of the indigenous people is still actually largely being taught nationwide. Mm -hmm. There's also um, there's a couple other factors too. Like um, I know um, for like the Seminole Miccosukee, like there's certain ceremonies that don't line up with the school calendar. So there would be like a huge portion of time where like seminal kids wouldn't be in school because they had ceremony uh, or whatever it might be. And that, that was a conflict. And there's also other cultural practices that again, like you say, they just don't align with Western right. um, views or Western practices. They made it very difficult uh, for their success. Aside from the systemic reasons, like, like with the experiences of boarding schools and things uh, that happened just in live memory, you know, that really there's just so there's such a bad taste, I think, collectively mm -hmm. in, in the mouths of indigenous people for Western education um, that when there is another option or another option can be made, that that's usually the go to. He mentioned um, like ceremony and, you know, case in point when I, you know, growing up, whenever there were like green corn and things like that, I haven't been to a green corn ceremony and I can't tell you how many years because it, it they, they occur while we're teaching and I can't get that many you know that that many days off in a row to to go um I you know there's a lot of different ceremonies that I've had to not be a part of any longer because we don't get the days off you know we get Christmas and we get you know spring break or whatever but those are all euro centered yeah. time yeah. and then yeah. also uh, you also have to uh account the fact that there are students that are not counted as Native Americans. Yeah, I did want to mention that as well. Like, there's a lot of students. We actually have more Indigenous students than we probably believe we do. I know that Kim and I were not on the on the Broward County Public School roster listed as Indigenous or Native American, um, though we are. And you have a lot. You, so there are actually, we do have Indigenous kids in school. There isn't quite as much, especially considering that we have a reservation here. You would think there'd be more. But again, there's a lot Those of are reasons number 1200? There, uh, there's one question here that I wanted to, to address just before, because uh, then we're like out of time, but. Uh, the resources, by the way, are on the Huvu uh, app. Yeah. They're right inside our course in the Huvu app. And access to more resources. There's there's not a lot of good free stuff out there. And, and um, if you go on to the SharePoint for um, the, the equity and diversity uh, department, there are, we do have some resources available there um, that can be accessed. Um, but it, that, that's a problem that we've actually had with, with creating our PDs and trying to provide teachers with things that they can use that they don't have to purchase. Um, it's very difficult. There's not a lot, because most of the stuff that is free out there either isn't accurate or it's not written from the perspectives of indigenous people. Um, but we, we are slowly finding everything we can and what we do find, uh, we've been put, sharing on the SharePoint for um, the equity and diversity um, page. Uh, Coach, do you find that when you're trying to share your cultural traditions, there's certain restrictions on what you can share? Like there's certain things that are sacred that you can't share. And so we don't get that perspective on it. And uh, I, I guess people don't realize that because you can't share certain things don't mean you don't have certain feelings about things that other people do. And you kind of have to let it slide off because I don't want to give away our traditions because it's like forbidden, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. how, do, how, do, how do you navigate that part? Because I know you guys have probably been in a situation where you're like, wait a minute, you know, uh, there's some secret things that we hold true in our culture, but we can't really share it with people outside of the culture. But how do you navigate that part? Um, like the feathers was like one thing that, you know, like gets me burning all the time. Um, you know, and like, I've, we don't bring our feathers everywhere. We don't show them everywhere, but like, you know, the most, like I've, 
I've liked the fact that we're doing this PD and I can share some things. And during the PD, I actually do take feathers out and show, show them on the PD, but like explaining the, the importance behind it so that maybe in the future, we don't see Victoria's Secret models, you know, on the mm -hmm. runway in a headdress that just makes every part of my body cringe, right. um, <laughs> you know, or, you know, we were, uh, at Sawgrass and they have the rip off of yeah. like they're on seminal land and they were ripping off seminal you know patchwork and selling it you know knock off patchwork in their stores and I was just like oh. and some of the patchwork you know like some of it like I was telling um Ninoska like I've learned a little bit because I do have some family friends that I grew up with on on the seminal res I can't show it to you because it is um, it's, you know, those are sacred patterns and things like that. So I know how to do it because, you know, I grew up there and they taught me, but like, I can't share that because first off, I'm not semi. Secondly, like, you know. It's a sacred tradition that only people that's a member of the group are basically entitled to, right. which is okay. But now a lot of people outside of the group don't quite get it. But and as long as we teach them yeah. that there, this is it's out there. It just is sacred, and yeah, you know right. that I think that's that's the. Yeah. the like I'm glad y'all talked about the turtle a little bit, so they they can at least see that there's certain animals and mm -hmm. and like you said, the plants and things of that nature that you kind of look at just differently from this Western centered ideology of what nature is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you guys did it, read the poem about the tree. I know it was, it was a longer thing than that because I saw that we have a chapter four out of probably, you know, a couple of uh, 50, 60 chapters, but it still, it still is something that kind of gives them and us a sort of perspective on how you view, what's your worldview of, um, of our land and, and, and property and nature and, I would say if we could adopt that, we would be a lot better off. But um, unfortunately, uh, I think Colton, you hit it on the head. When you're not from the land that you're occupying, you don't really value it like you should. You know what I mean? So no matter how long we talk about it, and then of course, you know, I know that we can try to make some gains in that direction, but they simply won't understand it because they, they're not coming from that worldview absolutely and language is a big part of that too they like there's so much indigenous knowledge of the land that's just lost from from language that's lost or like like i'm not like i i don't speak you know i don't speak so like or anything like that and um i've come to understand that there is just parts of my culture that i will never know unless i really make the effort and like try to become like somewhat fluent because it's just things some things just don't translate so um it's impossible, in a sense, to know enough about the land from an outside perspective. Um, and I really appreciate, you know, the conversation that you're having with us. And it seems like Betray you really, um, like you get it. And I appreciate that. Betray email. <laughs> also, I wanted to answer real quick. Um, Chas answer, asked the question about there being um, schools for uh, Seminoles specifically. And here in Hollywood, there is not. They do have a school on Big on Big Cypress. Um, there's another school in Brighton, which is actually a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Immersion. Thank you. Immersion school there, where you know they're learning more their language. They're learning through their language, and which I love to see. And if you come to our PD, come to our PD. Um, <laughs> plugging RPD. Uh, we do, we talk about immersion schools. We show some videos on different immersion schools. You know, we get into the history of the, kind of the sometimes why the trust isn't there between the public schools and the tribes. The name of the PD is the history and culture of, of the indigenous. indigenous. Hopefully they, they bring us back for the fall. Request us if you're interested. Yeah. <laughs> then I have to. All right, we're going to let you guys get back, I think, to the main session. I'm pretty sure we've gone over time. I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for listening to us and, and uh, engaging. Thank you, Daniel. But definitely reach out. Our emails are up there. So, you know, reach out. The Whova app, you can still reach out to us um, because, you know, we love to share. I think you guys are brave uh, to... Thank you, sir. Uh, say the least, because a lot of people would, be, like you say, they would be frustrated with the whole process 
And like Colton uh, alluded to earlier, just sometimes people just don't get it. And you, it, it could be a frustrating endeavor to try to keep trying to explain something that they just don't see. Right. And uh, I'm just glad you guys are taking a more proactive and positive approach to it. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy that we have this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is hard, like you said, because sometimes, you know, like I said in the beginning, there's all the don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And you don't want to slap people on the hand all the time because then they don't do anything. And we definitely don't want that. So we appreciate the reception as well as, you know. All right, y'all. Take care.